everything is inspired by the teachings of His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada, who is the founder and charter of the International Society for Krishna Consciousness, who is God. And just by the way, we phrase the question, you know, where we lean. Who is God, not what is God? So the first thing is, is God an impersonal light, a force field, or is he a person? Now you might have an international company like Microsoft organized in such a way as to maximize their sales, their distribution, their acquisition, their R&D, their research and development and technology, their HR, their human resources. Anybody would have to be totally out of their mind to think that all that was organized from some impersonal office at the top. It's very obvious that where you have a well-managed multinational corporation with operations all around the world, you're going to come to a person. Even in this room, you could see electricity as an impersonal energy. But as soon as you start to trace the electricity back to its source, a powerhouse, you know that an engineer had to build that powerhouse. A caretaker has to tweak things and make sure it's maintained. The fact is that wherever you find organization, we find it everywhere in the tiny atom. We find it in the micro, we find it in the macro. This universe is most completely organized. There are planets traveling at tens of thousands of miles per second. They're all in orbits in such a way that they don't crash into each other. Now, everything attests to the presence of a supreme CEO, a supreme organizer. The question is, who is God? You hear people talk about God all the time. You go to the church, the temple, the mosque. God, 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 God. Well, did you ever wonder who are they talking about? Because there's a shortage of descriptions about personal qualities. I've probably heard in my lifetime, aside from Krishna consciousness, the word God thrown out from the pulpit and from the podium thousands and thousands of times, and yet accompany that is hardly any personal information about him. Now, doesn't that seem odd to you? The question should arise in any, who is that person who ever refers to as God? It's like you can say the president, the president, the president, the president, the president. And that tells us certain things about the office. We know he lives in the White House on Pennsylvania Avenue. He drives a limousine. When I was a kid, Ike Eisenhower came to our little town in Pennsylvania. And he was waving everybody, and as a kid, I saw his license plate was number one. He has his own plane, that's also called Air Force One. But none of that answers the question, who is that person who occupies the position of the presidency? Now, here are some of the features of a man-made government, United States of America. You have the top executive head, you have the president, and then you have all these cabinet ministers, ministers of finance, ministers of home affairs, ministers of defense, ministers of homeland security, ministers of industry. Let's look at the universe and see if there are parallels between the way the universe is set up and the way a corporation or a government is set up. Look here. We have the home ministry. In the mundane government, it has to do with law and order, police. And in the universal government, it's law of karma. What goes around comes around. You sow the seed, you face the deed. Whatever you do comes back to you. Law of cause and effect. Ensure the balance is perfect. Detecting whatever you do, good and bad, it will resurrect. You have the defense ministry. In the mundane, ordinary government, it's meant to offer protection. We have our ICBMs. We have our radar. We have all kinds of defense mechanisms to keep intruders and invaders from taking our land and our rights away from us. And similarly, this universe also has certain protective measures, the ozone layer. Our body has a protective system called an immune system. Every single animal in the 8,400,000 species of life, which are spread throughout the universe, every single one of them has some protective defensive mechanism. It may be claws, it may be a shell, it may be the ability to run fast, whatever it is. So we're starting to see a lot of parallels here. Finance, let's talk about the Ministry of Finance, has to do with wealth and currency. Yes, in the universe there are gold mines, there's silver. So all this comes from the natural Ministry of Finance, which was inbuilt with the creation of this universe. Power, we need power. Now there's so much emphasis on wind and solar power. The wind has been here forever, the solar power has been here forever, and now we're starting 
to learn more about how to harness it and use it so we don't have to burn coal, which is also another source, has been a source of power and electricity for about a hundred years. Going down the list, just hitting the high points, healthcare and medicine, the whole science of Ayurveda shows you how to keep yourself healthy, not so much by dealing with symptoms after the fact, but by living a lifestyle and eating in such a way that you're proactive. Education, the Vedic literatures at the beginning of creation, when Lord Brahma engineered the stuff of this material creation, he was also imparted, Tene Brahma Rida Ya Arikavaya Mayantisura, from within the heart, Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, imparted into the heart of Brahma, the Vedas. The Vedas cover all areas of knowledge, both mundane and spiritual. In fact, Veda means knowledge. It's not that there was ever a time that knowledge began. Two plus two was always four in all times, in all places, in all circumstances. Vedic knowledge is imperishable, unchangeable, axiomatic. And it was there with Lord Brahma from the very beginning of creation. And then domestic supply, food, water. Just look at the oceans. What is it? 80% of the surface of the globe is water. We need water. You can fast at least 70 days will safely. But after three days of not drinking water, you're going to die. So water is the most essential element. And look at what God has supplied. 80% of the surface there is covered by water. Of course, it's salty. Ah, but he's also got that figured out too. The sun beats onto the surface of the salt water, extracts the fresh water, raises it in the form of clouds. The clouds waft over the cooler atmosphere of mountains and then the clouds open up to be fresh, drinkable, usable rainwater. What an amazing system. I believe that every time we drink a glass of water, we should not take that for granted, but we should say, thank you, Lord. This is the byproduct, this is the end product of an incredible universal system so that we can get that element which is most needed for our survival. And then how about cleanliness? How about the fact that there, at least before we started eating away at them, vast rainforests with trees which are produced through photosynthesis, oxygen, and sunlight, and all kinds of purifying elements as well. And then, of course, in the state, if you follow the laws and you work productively, there are certain rewards that, that come to a, an honest, good, providing, contributing citizen. Similarly, by the law of karma, good activities, good behavior, altruism, humanitarianism, kindness, compassion, these things come back to you. What goes around comes around. You sow the seed, you face the deed. Every element that's in the material, mundane, secular government is there in the universal order, only on a much more grand, godlike scale. Lord Brahma, when we just referred to himself, declared that the source of all of that is named Krishna. Ishvara Parama Krishna, Satchinananda Vigra, Anadira Dir Govinda, Sarva Karana Karana. He said, because there are so many elements, finance and cleanliness and hygiene and nutrition and all like that, there have to be different departments and there are different departmental heads, there are different cosmic universal managers, of course, but who is it who's the CEO? Who is it that's above and beyond all of them? His name is Krishna. He has a body which is Sachi Ananda Vigraha. Whereas our body is made of mucus, bile, and phlegm, his body is also made of three elements, but less obnoxious. <laughs> eternity, bliss, and knowledge. He has a body made of eternity, bliss, and knowledge. Anadir Govinda Sarva Karana Karana. There are many living beings who are empowered in certain areas, in the area of air, in the area of water. Every planet has a presiding deity. There's a deity in charge of sunlight. There's a deity Indra in charge of rain. There's a personality in charge of each and every one of the elements that it takes in order to run the universe. And they themselves have a measure of control over other living beings, but each and every one of those universal departmental heads has a controller over him. Just like you might experience at home, if you're married, you're the boss of the kids, but your wife is the boss of you. <laughs> and then you go to work and then you have another boss. And you have a... We have a certain area over which we have influence, but then we're also 
serving somebody else, and then he's serving somebody else, and then you, you have the great demigods, and then the demigods themselves, even up to Lord Brahma, and I say Lord Brahma because I'm talking about this universe, but there's millions of universes and millions of Lord Brahmas, they all answer ultimately to one single supreme personality who's called Krishna. That's not his only name, obviously, but it's the highest nomenclature. Krishna means all attractive. Whether a name for God refers to his wealth, beauty, fame, knowledge, whatever, at the end of the day, it adds up to him being all attractive. Now that supreme personality is known in three phases. There's a neophyte stage, there's a middle stage, and then there's an advanced stage. He's known initially as being everywhere present. You, you might have heard people say, well, God is everywhere. And that's true. He pervades, he permeates, and supports everything that exists through his effulgence, which is called the Brahma Jodi. Just like sunshine is everywhere. We couldn't live a half an hour without sunshine. There's nowhere that there's no sunshine. Even now, you can't see the sun globe, but yet there's sunshine everywhere. The impersonal energy of the Lord called Brahman is compared to the sunshine, and that's the all-pervasive feature of the Lord. Now God is everywhere. This is that aspect of the Lord is within the heart. He's called Paramatma. Each and every one of us, we're spirit. We're also made of eternity, bliss, and knowledge, but we're infinitesimal as opposed to the infinite Lord. We are qualitatively equal with Him, but quantitatively we just don't stack up. Both the President and I have the quality of being Americans. We share that quality. He's an American, I'm an American, but he's the most powerful American, and I'm a very insignificant American. So the difference between me and the President is a quantitative difference. That expansion of the Lord who's everywhere in the hearts of every living being, even the ants, even the germs, is called parma. If the impersonal effulgence is compared to the sunshine, the paramatma, the super soul in the heart of living beings, is compared to the sun globe. We haven't stopped yet. We've got one more place to go. There's a third aspect. First is Brahman. The second is paramatma. And the third is called Bhagavan, and this is God as the supreme person. You have the sunshine, which is all-pervasive. You have the sun globe, which is localized. Then you have the sun god. Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, imam bibhashate yogam praktabam habiyam. In the very beginning of creation, I had the same conversation that I'm having with you, Arjuna, several millions of go years ago with the sun god, Bhivashan. So ultimately, it all comes back to a person. And that person describes himself in the Bhagavad Gita. You don't have any scripture quite like the Bhagavad Gita, the Song of God. It's 700 verses. 90% of the verses are coming directly from the mouth of God. Find me any scripture where God talks virtually uninterruptedly for 700 Verses. The only punctuation is Arjuna asking a question so that Krishna can further clarify a point. Not only that, but to whom is Krishna speaking? Bahuni me vyati tani janmani tabaha tani hamsabi nittam beda parantapa. Krishna says to Arjuna, You and I have taken many, many births. We've reincarnated many, many times together. That's how close Arjuna is to Krishna. Arjuna is Krishna's friend to the point that when Krishna incarnates time after time after time, Arjuna accompanies him as his friend. So not only are there 700 verses directly enunciated from the mouth of God, but they are spoken to his most intimate friend. What does that mean to us? This is not only the most voluminous example of God speaking, but it is the most confidential. Who do you bear your soul with? Who do you share your mind, your intimate details with? Who do you confide in? Not some stranger on the street, not some backstabber at the office who plays politics. You do it to that person whom you trust, whom you love, who's your most intimate friend. But we have to understand that the quality of knowledge which comes from the Bhagavad Gita is unsurpassed. There's nothing that comes even close to it. And that's why 
in throughout all the Western countries and all the thousands of years of religion, nobody can even say who God is in any specific, elaborate, detailed way. You have to take advantage of the Bhagavad Gita to expand and amplify your knowledge. And we do that all the time. We're living in LDS Utah and ask any LDS person, what's the Book of Mormon? It is supplementary and it is complementary to the Bible. It will help you understand if there are certain seeds of knowledge which are in the Bible, the, the ideas of the Book of Mormon will help you understand better your Bible. It's not going to contradict it. So we take the same principle, we take the ball and run with it. The Vedic knowledge is complete and comprehensive. If you just want to be a Catholic, if you just want to be a Mormon, if you want to be a Hare Christian, then, then just forget about it. Just look for the exit and take off. But if you want to know God, you can't avoid the Bhagavad Gita because this gives you the highest, most detailed understanding of God coming right from the mouth of God himself, speaking to his best friend. Now, how do we understand the Bhagavad Gita? There's 3,000 different editions of the Bhagavad Gita in the English language. First of all, you have to understand that this is a real happening. Some of the so-called commentators of the Bhagavad Gita take it as allegorical or symbolic. They even go so far as to say the incidences which are described in the Bhagavad Gita, the Kurukshetra War, the Karavas and the Pandavas did not happen. The first thing you have to take is this is history. This is real. One should not start by accessing an author who twists the truth and brings some allegorical meaning out of the Bhagavad Gita. It also should be understood in disciplic succession. This is the authorized way to understand the Bhagavad Gita. If you want to be a doctor, you may go to medical school, you may know all the medical journals, you may know the procedures and everything, but there's one thing you have to do before you can be certified as a doctor. Anybody know what that is? Yeah, before you get your license, you have to do your residency. In other words, you have to train under more experienced doctors. You need to take advantage of their knowledge, that lore. Otherwise, you can't claim to be a bona fide doctor. Same thing with law. You have to go and pass the bar, and then you have to clerk in a law office. So similarly, if you want to understand the Supreme Personality of Godhead, there's a system in place for that. It's described right there in the Bhagavad Gita. If you have a medicine, you can't just take the medicine when you feel like it and how many pills you feel like it. There's a prescription, one in the morning, one in the evening, with food, without food. And that's how the medicine is going to do you good. In the Bhagavad Gita, 4th chapter, 34th verse, there's a prescription how to understand the Bhagavad Gita. Learn the truth from someone who's seen the truth. Someone who themselves have trained under a bona fide spiritual master and then can pass down that lore. Example is given... In India, when they pick mangoes, they don't just go to the top of the tree and drop the mango on the ground. It's going to be smashed, bruised, inedible, unrecognizable. They have a ladder of climbers, and one picks it, gives it to the person down, gives it to the person down, gives it, and then it reaches the ground perfectly unblemished and relishable and full of juice. So the Bhagavad Gita should be passed down by devotees, not messed up, interpreted spoiled by non-devotees. Thirdly, Krishna says, Vedas daham asaram eva veda. All the Vedic literatures with all the knowledge that's contained there is like a great tree. But the ultimate fruit of the tree, what's the point of the, the roots? What's the point of the trunk? What's the point of the bark? What's the point of the leaves? What's the point of the twigs? Except to have the fruit. So what is the fruit of the Vedas? Krishna says, it is to know me as a supreme personality of Godhead. Krishna is not just a historical figure. He's not an ordinary man. He's not even an extraordinary man. He is the supreme personality of Godhead, descended to earth to explain himself, to reveal the glories of the spiritual world through his friend Arjuna, and to invite us back. So God is literally on bended knee, canvassing us. Please, don't keep mucking around in this material world. You are my child. You are crowned with favor. You have my DNA. I don't like it that you're suffering unnecessarily birth, death, disease, and old age over and over in this material world. You simply take shelter of me and I will guide your footsteps back to home, back to God. One devotee said, 
about Lord Ram, who's another incarnation of Krishna. He said, long did I toil and found no earthly rest. Far did I roam, found no certain home. Till at last I sought them in Ram's sheltering breast, who opens his arms and bids the weary come with Ram. I found a home, a rest divine, and I since them am Ram's. Ram is mine. The good I have is from Ram's store supplied. The ill is only what Ram deems the best. With Ram as friend, I'm rich with nothing else beside, and poor without him, though of all possessed. Changes may come, I take or I resign, content but I am Ram's, and Ram is mine. Changes may come, but in Ram no changes seen. Ram's like a glorious sun that wanes not nor declines. Ram walks above the storms and clouds serene, and on his devotees inward darkness shines. While here, alas, I know but half Ram's love, but half discern him, and but half adore. But when I meet Ram in the realms above, I hope to love him fully, praise him more, and show and tell among the kirtans divine how fully I am his and he is mine. Just try to learn the truth by approaching a spiritual master, inquire from him submissively, render service unto him. The self-realized soul shall impart knowledge unto you because he's seen the truth. This whole temple with all of the grounds in our temple in Salt Lake City and our radio station, the Festival of Colors, it is all our offering to our spiritual master. Our spiritual master wanted Krishna consciousness to spread to every town and village in the world. So we thought, Spanish Fork. <laughs> Spanish Fork. Anybody go to New York, Chicago, Los Angeles? You know? But Spanish Fork. I think that will put a smile on my spiritual master's face. And if my spiritual master is pleased by the almost 50 years we spent in Spanish Fork, then my life is successful. But this whole project is just nothing more than a labor of love on the part of a disciple trying to please his spiritual master. It's winding up here. Bhagavan. Bug means opulence, his mind means possessor. In India, we don't refer to God as God. Why? Because God refers to only one of the six opulences of the Supreme. God means power or controller. So certainly God is the most powerful. He's the controller, but that's not all he is. In the Western countries, we acknowledge that God is the controller. He's the most powerful. We also acknowledge that he's the most knowledgeable. But beyond that, it's very, very nebulous. It's unmapped. In the term Bhagavan, we find the concept certainly power, certainly knowledge, but we go further now. We're also talking about wealth. God created everything. That means he's the most wealthy. He's the most famous. Nobody hasn't heard of God. Even atheists talk about God all the time. He's the most humble. Think about that for a moment. God is the most humble. How is that? He has more reasons than anybody else to be puffed up. How could God not be puffed up? He's the strongest. He's the most knowledgeable. He's the wealthiest. He's the most famous. If I get even a little fame, even a little wealth, I'm walking around like thinking I'm the cat's meow, God's gift to the world. You go to the gym and you're starting to actually see a little definition in your try. So what do you do? You roll up your sleeve and you kind of like take every opportunity <laughs> like check it out. You know what I'm saying? How could God, who's the strongest, the most knowledgeable, the most powerful, how could he be humble? Well, he is. Because the definition of God is that he's the supreme in every area. Nobody can outdo him in wealth, fame, strength, beauty, and humility. Think about humility. Have you known people who are good looking and yet you hate their guts? People who are wealthy and yet you wouldn't want to be in the same room with them? People who are famous and they're just conceited fools and rascals? Without that quality of humility, none of the other opulences will make you attractive. And Krishna means all attractive. So when you think about it, yes, as well as being the most wealthy, the most intelligent, the most famous, and the most knowledgeable, he would be the most humble. And that's fascinating to me. That means that you guys, you came here, you're kind of goofing around there, doing all kinds of unrelated things. God is not looking to find fault with you. I might be, but he's not. <laughs> all he knows is that you came here. He's not seeing you lie on the floor in front of the altar or any of that stuff. He's just taking the best quality. He's saying they had so many options. 
Maybe it wasn't even a choice. Maybe you have to go here. Otherwise, you're going to fail the course. God doesn't consider all of that. He always gives us the benefit of the doubt. He cuts us slack. He says, it's so nice they've come to the temple on Sunday afternoon. They could be here or there or anywhere, but they came to the temple. He's not thinking, I'm God, this is my temple, you're my servant, and you should be here, and you should be bowing down and sitting up straight and listening attentively. He's not saying any of those things. Why? He's the most humble. If he wasn't the most humble, he wouldn't be, do you, will you agree with me, the most attractive. Now there's one more quality that God doesn't cover. When we say God, we just don't cover this. Can anyone guess what it is? Remembering that God is supreme in every area. Would God really, I mean seriously, be an old man? with white hair and wrinkles and a beard? Is that consonant with an all-powerful God who's supreme in every area? Could there be anybody better looking than God? Could God be like people you see in the old age homes and the senior citizens home? You know, could, could that be the supreme personality of God in all wealth and all kind? I don't think so. Most of you have an image of Michelangelo's painting of the old guy on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. If you recall the details, there's some cherubs, there's little angels uh, charged with holding him up. He apparently can't stand. He's lying horizontal. He's exhausted, apparently, with the creation of this one tiny little planet. <laughs> it wore him out. And so there's one little cherub holding an ankle. There's a cherub holding a wrist. There's one nursing his head, holding his head from plopping. And I don't know what the one cherub did wrong. <laughs> I don't know what he's being punished for. So there's one right under, taking the whole weight of his midsection. You know, all the other cherubs are like, nah, nah, nah. And this guy's like, can I get some little help here? And it doesn't look like there's any forthcoming. So how could that possibly be God? We really should do ourselves a favor in the Western cultures by getting a better, fresher idea of God. Because you're not going to have any enthusiasm. You're going to have any fervor for serving the Lord, living eternally with some old guy. That's just antithetical to the excitement and the freshness that should be part and parcel of your journey back to home, back to God. Bhagavad, God is he who possesses the most wealth, fame, strength, knowledge, beauty, and renunciation. You find someone who's smarter than somebody else, you go back to the original smartest person, in fact, the source of intelligence, whose intelligence is eternal, that's Krishna. You find the strongest person, you, there's always someone stronger and stronger and stronger. You go back to the person whose strength is eternal, unlimited. That's Krishna. Here, and during the seventh year, when he was exhibiting his pastime as a seven-year-old boy, Lord Indra, in this picture over here, he got upset with something Krishna did, and he called in those clouds which are usually invoked at the annihilation of the universe. Very, very dangerous storms and clouds. And he unleashed all the power of those clouds on this tiny little village in India. <laughs> the clouds which newly, usually destroy the universe were pinpointed in this little village. Krishna, at first he thought of destroying Indra and his whole heavenly kingdom, but then he thought, I think, I think I'll do something a little more interesting. And what he did is he lifted a mountain called Govardhan. With the little finger of his left hand, he held it as an umbrella for seven days. So while the, the storms raged and this, the water came down and the winds blew, all the inhabitants and all the cows and all the monkeys partied for seven days. They were totally comfortable. But Krishna is the source of unlimited strength. Here it is described. I am the source of all spiritual and material worlds. Everything emanates from me. Finishing up here. Everything in this material world is governed by the law of cause and effect, isn't it? We recently had the COVID epidemic. So how did we purportedly, I mean, I'm not taking sides on this, but how did we purportedly create a vaccine for the COVID virus? We analyzed the cause and effect. You see, if you can remove the cause of something, then you remove the effect. I don't know about COVID, but that's how we eliminated polio. That's how we eliminated yellow fever. That's how we eliminated the scarlet fever. Yellow fever, for instance, it came from mosquitoes. And so we had a campaign against that type of mosquitoes. And have you heard of anybody that's had yellow fever? 
in the last 50, 60 years because we removed the cause. Everything in this material world is governed by the law of cause and effect. And yet God is the one entity who has no cause. Nothing caused him. People say, if God caused anything, who caused God? Well, that, that's God. <laughs> He's the one that causes everything but doesn't cause. People sometimes ask me, why is Krishna blue? And I say, well, every color comes from Krishna. He's the source. He's the singularity from which everything comes. Red, yellow. And he has Ram's the uh, greenish incarnation. The Shring is uh, more Lord Chaitanya's golden. Kapil is white. They're all different avatars of different multicolors that come from Krishna. But Krishna is not blue because of some prior cause. I just tell people he's blue because he's blue. God wants nothing more than our liberation. He wants nothing more than to bring us back into a sheltering breast. He stands with open arms. He appears on the altar with his flute and he invites us to join with him in an eternal play called Leela in the spiritual world. He has no personal agenda. He simply loves us just in the same way that a father or mother will often sacrifice their own lives for the safety and well-being of their children. Krishna took the trouble to come down and descend here 5,300 years ago only for the purpose of trying to relieve us from our suffering condition. He exhibited while he was on the planet for 125 years all riches. He exhibited all strength. It's not that we're saying he's God and we can't prove it. These are the credentials. All fame, he spoke the Bhagavad Gita off the top of his head in a half an hour, and here we are studying it for the last 40 years in Spanish for Utah. <laughs> all beauty, all knowledge, and all renunciation are all humility. So if you want to know who is God, we present Krishna. He has all the qualifications.